everyone. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really grateful to be here. It's been a gift already to share this space with you all. And I'm a practicing writer, not an academic. And so um, that means I'm often in the wilderness. I don't have a PhD group of people that I'm connecting with or a grad program or anything. I'm off writing, um, just following the poems where they lead. So to be in a collective space like this is really nourishing already. And I can't wait for the days ahead um, to see what surfaces. Um, so the poems that I'm sharing today come from a manuscript that is centered on uh, Petronilla, which is the daughter of St. Peter. Um, she is kind of a mythological daughter. There's different stories about her. Um, and also the voices of other witnesses, such as the magpie. Um, these sort of symbolic witnesses that hang at the edges of um, maybe the Bible, maybe mythology, um, and often non-canonical texts. Um, which is why I like to spend a lot of time as I geek out about these things. Um, because I'm really interested in the way that they kind of speak to our spirituality as a kind of inheritance, um, a body of images and language and structures that to me and my practice are really as potent as an ancestry. Um, and that's sort of how I connect with them and come to them via poetry. Um, and I think that's interesting when we talk about poetry just because um, you know, I don't know how a theologian would do it, but it, for me, the images come first, and then I follow them, and I learn why they showed up. Um, and so as we think about how to tussle with what we inherit in an old tradition like Catholicism, um, you know, those things are coming through all the time, and we're wrestling with what they mean to our lived experience, how to address them in sort of the context of things that are happening now with the church, um, you know, like sex abuse scandal, women not having equity in certain roles. Um, those are things that I don't always feel like, and I, I don't really fit in the church from a faith perspective <laughs> anymore on those things. Um, and so I can't really address them in the institution, but poetry is the place where I can dismantle them, make them whole in some way that makes sense, um, and rehome the inheritance in a way. Um, so I'm gonna start with a few poems. You'll, these are, um, some of them will be in the voice of Petronilla. Um, most of them come from that manuscript in a sequence of poems. Um, and I'll just share a handful of them. And so the first one is called Descendants. Restless for the language an ancestor spoke and to the sky of their God, we sift remnants of tongues, break the breath. We count in generations, and this is false math. The ladder of my spine is lined by shores that were not ours to fish by altars where we bowed and altars we burned, by prayers kept and killed. And we are not done yet, inventing names for what will save us. Even now, some speak of doves and some speak of towers. So this next one works with Petronilla and the, the myth around that. And there's a passage from the Acts of Philip that says, um, Peter, the leader, thus fled from every place where there was a woman. Moreover, he was scandalized due to his daughter, who was very beautiful. Therefore, he prayed to the Lord, and she became paralyzed on one side, so that he might not be beguiled. Um, <laughs> so it's a really interesting thing that happens sometimes in these edge cases of, you know, why are the men doing this to the women, and what threat is happening there? Um, and I've learned since this that paralysis actually at that time would have been associated with infertility. So for her, him to pray for paralysis would actually be kind of a prayer for the death of her lineage in a way. Um, so I find that really interesting. Um, and this poem is called, When I Try to Imagine My Father's Prayer. Which part of my body most worried him? Was it the eyes, my shoulders, the calf of my elbow? What is it like to see my body as he once saw it, beautiful and charged, able to swing the gaze of a man and make him forget the sea, make him forget his fishing nets, make him leave everything and follow? Has there ever been a body like that that hasn't been dangerous? This is called One for Sorrow, Two for Joy. There was so much grief to go around, but the men could only grieve for themselves. Grief too much for their bodies, so they hung it in the trees. My father to the crabapple, Judas to the redbud. Even though they had been promised something more than their bodies, he 
even though they were only grieving a body. But I didn't dare speak of freedom now. Swallowed the magnetic blue feathers of the magpies in my mouth. Helped my mother fix dinner for my father while the crabapple blossoms fell away from the kitchen window. So I played with the magpie nursery rhyme, one for sorrow, two for joy, three for, uh, three for a girl, four for a boy, and that's kind of a sequence of poems, and I'm just sharing a couple of them today. Um, this next one is three for a girl, and it's after a form of poetry called the golden shovel um, that Terrence Hayes created in honor of Gwendolyn Brooks, and I usually take lines from a poet whose work you admire. So I uh, worked with lines from Jane Kenyon's Let Evening Come, and this is called Wait For It. My father falls asleep in the garden. This is how I learn God has a sense of humor. My father falls asleep in the garden, and he does remember the buttercups, but he does not remember the arrival of soldiers or the locusts taking leave of their chafing just before. This is how I know God is waiting for us to hear the punchline, the dry and comfortless laugh reserved for the man late to his own story. So humor God is, he gives my father three more chances to let the ending go otherwise. After that evening, the dreams come, a woman carrying 153 fish who tells me, don't be afraid. Every morning after, I clean my father's net, let the linen slip between my hands and spread it out to dry. In the evening, I refasten each of the stones and test the weight of what's to come. When my father finds me bent to the work, I want to say, don't be afraid, but he is not ready yet. Those with ears, let them hear. My father is prone to striking off what he doesn't understand. The ear of the boy in the garden is an impulse I know well. So I am surprised when he comes to me and says he will let me join them on the boat. I don't know what he dreams, but that morning on the water, I am ready for the words that come. Friends, haven't you caught any fish? My father tries to hear the man on the shore, but it's just as well he doesn't catch the joke as the slap of fish fills the ear. We eat well that night. My mother lights every candle. We let every spot at the table be filled with a guest. It's long after evening when I hear the footsteps of soldiers. Now they have come to collect my father. He is telling a story and goes dead silent. Tomorrow, I will clean the net again, refasten the stones. But tonight, my mother laughs. She kisses his ear. She says, don't be afraid. So as I've been spending time with these different voices and um, these different images, one of the things that keeps coming up um, is the eighth station where Jesus meets the weeping women, and that kind of just started threading itself into the work. Um, so the passage from Luke, daughters of Jerusalem, weep not over me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For if in the green wood they do these things, what shall be done in the dry? And this poem is called Rooster Litany. This broken pew, long lacquered oak, its splinters swept. This broken pew, the kneeler drops, the organ puffs its chest. This broken pew, and still the basket passes whole. Oh, broken pew, the people in their purple dress. Oh, broken pew, and still the priest wears green. Oh, broken pew, and still the priest says, take this, eat. This, broken on our bodies, this, broken on our children's bodies, this, on our grandparents' bodies, but they could not tell us. Oh, broken body, the splintered oak, the organ boasts. Oh, broken body, and how our songs go dry. Oh, broken body, what can City of God give these children who will not be lullabied back from this? From this, the mass grave in Ireland, from this, the attic in Vermont, from this, the confessional in Montreal, from this, the room in Igloolik, 
from this, the rectory in Pennsylvania, from this, only the rooster feels better when he sings. Old promise, a God who counts the denials made cornerstone. O oh God, for this, let every child have a rooster. Let every child have a rooster. Let every child have a rooster. So shifting just a little, um, I was curious for this next one, how many people have seen a passion play? <laughs> how many people were at like a parish who did it every year? How many people were in one? Where are my cheer kinders? Yes, all right, so, okay. So we can share stories afterwards, so, all right. So this one is called Passion Play. In the sacristy, I consider striking distance and the angles of whips. How close would a Roman soldier need to be to solicit a gash? How close for a hairline of red? Would the whip roll across the skin in one clear lick? Or would it hiccup across the folds? Did the son of the father have folds of skin? Or was he polished tight by hard work like my father? How different are the muscles of a carpenter from the muscles of a forester? I decide on wide slashes, precise but hungry, as if the soldier had wanted to peel into the heart and apply the blood, a mix of caro syrup and red dye. Like Jesus in Gethsemane, my father did not want to be Jesus. He said he wanted to be Peter. The parish priest knew better. My father has never not wanted to be the hero. So every year, he carries a cross through St. Isidore's, trailed by the screams of parishioners, crucify him, crucify him. He wears a crown of thorns he made from a wild honey locust. And better than ash, it leaves a bloody mark on his forehead. We raise his body up on the cross he built himself from a redwood tree. My mother makes the same joke about trying to live with him when he thinks he's God. <laughs> and we practice his lines so much, they become a new kind of family prayer. I say, Father, if it is your will, and my brothers cry back, take this cup from me. <laughs> I say, the reason I was born, the reason I came into this world, and my brother's call, is to testify to the truth. <laughs> my father is known for his will. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But I covet the lines where Jesus sounds lonely and surprised by it. Peter, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour with me? as lonely as anyone who has ever tried to be human. Every year, I find a little more of the broken alien inside of him. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my subjects would be fighting to save me from being handed over. As it is, my kingdom is not here. Every year, I want more passion, less resurrection. Every year, the slashes get wider. So this will be my last poem, and then I'll hand it over to Carly. Um, and this one is called Inheritance Rosarium. And it's kind of set up like a rosary on the page. It's one of those that's probably more fun to read on the page to experience it, but um, I thought I would share it. As a girl, my mother overheard her grandmother praying to die. Every night after, the little girl composed counterweight prayers of live, live, live. Twenty years later, I was born, and they still walk this tightrope together. My great-grandmother, having no idea, God preferred the sound of my mother's voice. I was one of my mother's living novenas, not baptized in the church, but in the chapel of the nursing home, where my great-grandmother waited. As a girl, my grandmother told me when a loved one near death, she saw black crosses and waited for the phone to ring. Death was always near us and crossing itself. Even as I write this, a vulture circles the sky to the east. I had called my grandmother on the day she died, but I saw no crosses. On the night of her birthday, she slipped away in her sleep without warning, a perfect circle. When I doubt the possibility of mercy, I think of her death, the gone-to-sleep death, 
given to those who fear it most. My death won't be like that. I was baptized under death's wing as a girl born on a Friday, the day of sorrowful mysteries. I was a lent-hearted girl, prone to biting my lip too hard just to taste the salt, loved most the day the saints had gone to gallows. Lent was a gallery of unknowns. St. Isidore's shovel went missing under purple folds. The downturn of Jesus' face became a blunt clue. But I always knew where St. Therese stood, knew the shape of her small skull. The edges of her roses softened further under their purple veil, as though she had chosen the dark inside of the darkest one and buried herself in it. As a girl, I did not yet know my mother's prayers, did not know she was born on the day of glorious mysteries, but every night she wove a net of live under a woman who asked to be buried. I watched my great-grandmother for her rosaries, for the ropes of vein in her hands, for how she spoke in her old age. Her mouth sucked and the tongue pattered, and because she seemed the most holy person in my life, that is how I tried to form my prayers. Soft jaw and a knuckled rosary, a rose wrapped around a demand, show me, show me, show me. It's said a girl is carried inside the egg, inside her not yet mother, carried inside her future grandmother. My mother must have known. As a girl, she took my hand, pressed it to her side, and said, feel this. Single rib jutted away from the cage, a rupture created by my heel, evidence of life. If it's true, I waited on the tightrope of live, 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 was carried inside the black cross, and they were carried first by the woman who knew how to pray for death. If it's true, if God is there at all, she kicks us from the inside. Thank you, Emily, that was wonderful. Um, I'm very excited to get to share with you all today. Um, it's a great opportunity to be with you all and to share my poetry. Um, this particular poem I'm gonna be reading is in somewhat relation to what you've been reading based on my family history and based on my personal heritage. Um, this poem was nominated as a finalist for the Janet B. McCabe Prize through Ruminate which was judged by Ilya Kaminsky. And what's funny about that is that I kind of stole one of his lines when I was writing the poem. So I was like, full circle, that was great. Um, but in his book, Dancing in Odessa, he speaks about um, speaking for the dead. And that's what inspired this poem. It's called River Heat. I am the river heat that sneaks off the water, sweeps the curve of a neck, the arch of a brow, and traces the crescent turns of the soft bodies of my ancestors, the thick-blooded men and women who've seen and forsaken youth, forever passing down some purpose to their passion-fed babies. I am taking up the cross they've taken turns throwing down. I am the voice they heard echoing from a far way off, some hearing it in oceans, waves splashing shiplap, some hearing it over exaltations and executions in the town square, some hearing it in the breeze blowing through our sugar cane, some hearing it after the whine of a train whistle, and some from the static in the family room radio, all the while it's been their distant daughter singing. If I must speak for the dead, I must chant their rosary whispers, I must moan their midnight wishes. I must shout their high noon rejoicing. I must mutter their morning confessions, leaving them at the veil between the Lord and the layman. I must think like the Lord and the layman. I must be multitudes, be mystic, be my own mother, my own father, my daughters and my sons. I must think like a body of water. I must sing like a songbird tracing the origins of a nest. There is a red river running through me, full of heat and full of song, and as the river moves, must I move on. <laughs> <laughs> 